Hey, 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 hey. Good morning. Happy Tuesday, Center for Spiritual Living Palm Desert and friends all over the world. It's your guy, Reverend Charles Hall, with the other guy, that guy, my main man, Jafon Seeley. It's Tuesday, so we must be uh, exploring racist and anti-racist ideas. It's what we do on Tuesdays. <laughs> yeah. Stir, stir the pot. Stir the pot right? a little. Stir the pot a little. Get stirred. Definitely. That's the thing, you know, we were talking right before we came on live here. Um, you know, a great conversation. I, I, I seek to, I, I believe, and over the course of my life, have sought to put myself in situations, uh, whether it be through travel or through conversation, where I am stirred, where I am called to grow. It's not comfortable. But in that, I mean, if we're just around what's familiar all the time, how are we ever going to become something how are we ever going to explore? You know, it's in the even in the human spirit to explore, right? I mean, how many people have given their lives pushing the edge of what is known? Um, and we can look at that literally. We can look at that metaphorically as well. Right. So anyway, that's why I appreciate Tuesdays. Uh, we stir it up so that yeah. each of us can somehow lose our lives to find one that's that's more expressed more inclusive, more compassionate and loving. It's a, it's a really great point. You know, in, when you're saying that, um, I know for myself, when I first stumbled upon uh, Science of Mind, this particular book and many books in, uh, similar were things that maybe felt intuitively right, but challenged me. It was not just this, uh, oh, read this and suddenly you tap into this magic wand. It actually encouraged me to go in inward yep. and begin to identify all the areas that prevented me from recognizing my, my divine essence, so to say. Amen. And as we're going through this conversation, which is outside of the fringes of most people's comfort zones, myself included at times, that is the best place to grow and transform. So. Yep. These Tuesday conversations around this particular book and concepts, while we're standing upon principle, it is powerful for us to begin to recognize internally in our lives how we can expand and in doing so, as you mentioned, create yeah. a more inclusive and compassionate environment. Amen. It's Tuesdays with uh, Chiffon and, and Reverend Charles. Welcome. Welcome to the, the ride that never ends, baby. Uh, so welcome to all of you. As usual, please, we encourage questions and comments. We want your participation. We love it when you help make the show, the program, uh, even more powerful with your insights. Um, and as usual, we're going to let Jafon take the lead. And uh, I know he's got some material prepared for us. You know, it's interesting. I just want to bring up one thing before we go into our material. This chapter 10 white uh, today. Um, a guest I had yesterday is a friend of mine from back home. His name is uh, Bishop, Dr. Bishop Edward Donaldson. Mm -hmm. uh, black man, black minister, doctor, accomplished, extraordinary man. During the course of our conversation, one of the things came up, you know, just like we were just talking about it, as, as far as exploring uh, our divinity or becoming more ourselves. An interesting point that he brought up yesterday that I think is fitting for our Tuesday conversations is he said, you know, if I had the opportunity, we're talking about race and, and, and systemic racism and things that are happening in our, in, our, in, our, in our communities. And he said, you know, if I had the opportunity to meet with the, the head of the KKK, I would absolutely take it. And then some, someone, you know, why would you want to meet with the head of the KKK? And he's like, because somehow out of having that interaction, I can learn more about the divine. Hmm. Somehow out of having that interaction, um, I can learn more about the truth about life. Agreeing or disagreeing, you know, probably going to disagree with just about everything the guy has to say, but it's an opportunity that we don't ever want to turn away from an opportunity to learn more about the divine, mm -hmm. to learn more about the, the, the presence and however way that shows up, so long as we're not blinded by hate and ignorance and things like that, but it helps us wake up more. So to, just to the point, I was just reminded of that after doing that little intro there to the point of the discussion we were just having, let us not, and that takes a tremendous amount of courage, right? And he's, of course, he's like, well, my personal safety matters. I said, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So let's <laughs> let's just know that you're going to get out of there alive and untouched. All right. You'd still have the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I'd have the conversation to that point. I thought it was interesting. That takes a lot of courage, you know, to to, to stand in the face in front of somebody that would just have that doesn't even recognize you as a dignified human being and mm-hmm. still want to, to harvest something so that I can become more myself. Yeah. Wild, yeah, huh? That's a really powerful point. I mean, I think in this climate that we find ourselves in on, on this planet, particularly in America, um, what a great opportunity for us to discover more of the divine by way of interacting, engaging, talking to, uh, interacting with people who have completely different thoughts and ideas than ourselves. Mm. And finding the ways in which we may disconnect them from what we believe to be, the, there, I, there I go, what we believe to be divine. One of or, us is going to do it at some point. It's <laughs> yeah, all good. I had to start it off with a bang, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a really great uh, conversation. I know that my sister made a post <coughs> recently, and there was a somebody in our family um, who said something that was totally outlandish. And instead of me going into reaction mode, where oh, you pushed a button by saying something that I deemed as inappropriate, so I'm going to react. How can I actually choose to approach it and respond differently? Which is a another spiritual practice in itself. Can you find that space of freedom between the stimulus and the response and choose how you are going to respond instead of react in old patterns? Yep. So anyways. Spiritual practice, brother. Spiritual practice. Spiritual practice. Spiritual practice, of course. Well, All right, mate. You want to lead us, yeah. lead, us on, lead us to the promised land? <laughs> Let's go. Let's 40 go. years in this valley. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this uh, chapter... Chapter 10, everybody, and as you know, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Dr. Kendi. This, this was a, a really good chapter, Rev. Charles. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And before I actually share this, um, I feel that one thing that I hear often from family members or individuals who don't necessarily see the need for this type of conversation is kind of encompassed in this chapter specifically um, around, you know, anti-white rhetoric, um, anti-racism equaling anti-white rhetoric, uh, how racism doesn't necessarily apply to all white folks and the generalizations that all different people have to say, well, white people are this way. And so I feel that this was a, a really good chapter to kind of not just say, well, this is what's happening to the, this group of people, but expanding the net, so to say, to include more individuals to maybe see or identify how they may or may not align with particular things. Yeah, yeah. I think I say this every week, Jafon, but every week he continues to bring the conversation back to the individual, Mm -hmm. not the race, the individual. And when we can interact with the individual or the policy or the system, then there's a lot more freedom in that for me as well. It's not black people, it's not Asians, it's not white people. It's dealing, he keeps calling us to deal with people on a person by person basis. Right. And I I appreciate that. Definitely, definitely. So with that being said, you uh, you can see on the first page there, on chapter, chapter 10, let's see, page 122, uh, he always, begins with a definition. And again, if you all have questions, insights, comments, things you would like to discuss as we move through, please share that. Uh, So anti-white racist, one who is classifying people of European descent as biologically, culturally, or behaviorally inferior or conflating the entire race of white people with racist power. Uh, I think that that is something that is done often, um, particularly in today's climate saying, identifying a person by group identification instead of, as you said, Rev. Charles, individually. Yep. So I have a handful of slides that we can touch upon as we move through and I'll pause Ooh. periodically. Um, some of them, I didn't wanna type out the whole chapter because <laughs> <laughs> I have so many things that I underline. Um, so we can, I'll direct our attention to. Well, that. I did the same thing. I just started circling paragraphs. Yeah. And there's one too. in particular I'd like to read the entire, if you don't, you're probably going to touch on it because we tend to be in mind meld. 
Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. But if you don't, and it's and it's down the chapter a little bit, but anyway, I, okay. I, I want to reserve the right to, it's about half a page that I'd actually like to read word for word, so. Yes, yes, I, I will uh, grant, grant permission for that. <laughs> no. All right. Thank you. The, well, he starts off with a, a particular point that I think is a powerful concept that many of us could embrace. And he basically said, racist ideas love believers, not thinkers. That's great. There is a saying by Earl Nightingale. Uh, many individuals has, have heard of Earl Nightingale. Um, the Strangest Secret uh, audio recording back in the, I think maybe 60s or 70s. And he's in, in Earl, Earl Nightingale's saying, he said, the hardest thing for humans to do is to think. Mm. It is so much easier for our thoughts to be hijacked by way of the opinions, memories, past experiences, perceived notions of what is occurring around us that we simply let go of the steering wheel, which is our thought process, and allow ourselves to be dictated based upon that particular pattern. Thinking is a moment by moment experience. Therefore, ideas, particularly those that may be oppressive or hurtful in nature, often does not reflect somebody who is actually embracing their ability to think on a conscious level. Mm. So I just kind of want to park that out there. I love that, man. The word that comes up for me too is laziness. Like if you're not thinking, then you're, you're somehow you're lazy. And like, because thinking critically is going to make you act. Yes. And if I'm critically thinking about something and I'm critical of it, which isn't negative, it's just like I'm analyzing it, right? I'm taking it in, what fits, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, 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 mean, I, need, I, I will be compelled into some sort of action. And sometimes it's easier to just go along with the group think or not, not think you're intelligent enough to think critically. Right. That we don't feel empowered sometimes. So, yeah. Right. Right. It's a great and we, point. And we hear Ernest Holmes, we hear principle, we hear new thought teachings, conscious thought and the ability to think and recognize that your thoughts are empowered by the divine, which is a gift in itself. Yes. Therefore, to not embrace that ability to think consciously is to squander or at least not recognize or fully embrace those blessings that have been bestowed upon us. Amen. Um, so then he goes on to say on page 123, racist ideas suspend reality and retrofit history, including our individual histories. And this is kind of just a leading into this particular idea of his, uh, his particular thought process that I wanted to touch upon. Now, this is where I kind of have a few points and then we could, we could chat about it. But yeah. remember that courage is not the absence of fear, but the strength to do what's right in the face of it. And then I'll pause here and just kind of pop back to you because he talks about two particular things that really begin to make his mind think in an uh, anti-white type of way. One of the issues was the 2000 election and the voting issue that happened in Florida by way of uh, voter suppression or just simply ignoring a, a wide, a large amount of votes in a very tight presidential election who many of those votes that were pushed to the side or ignored were of uh, African-Americans. So that's one thing that he kind of captured. How does this happen? You know, oh, they're against black people. And yep. then the second one, which is, I would love to hear your opinion. And if you've, if you've heard of this was the concept in conversation around Elijah Muhammad mm -hmm. of the nation of Islam. Ha have you, were you familiar or are you familiar with, with his teachings? Not with the, the not with the the that where the, the devil came from, not where Satan came. I, I hadn't heard that creation story before. No, not me, neither, me neither. That was fascinating. It was. It's really fascinating. And then I, I think of the influence that that has had, particularly in that segmented group of individuals, to begin to uh, do what he says simultaneously to white people, what many throughout history white folks have done to black people. And to create this racial hierarchy and to then deem them as inferior by way of particular things or ideas that they're from a different place or they grew up in colder, colder climates or, you know, whatever the case may be. But it's right. fascinating how humans, we're talking about the human race, 
can create these concoctions, these ideas that will then put people superior or inferior on all sides of the spectrum. Yep. So it's not just a them versus us type thing. It is a human condition <laughs> that, and, and we're just seeing it right now in obviously modern history, but it's something that, that is there. It's, it's, you know, it's part of a, well, it's just, I think, part of mythology generally. You know, if we look at, at, at all sorts of stories from whatever context of the culture, uh, there's, you know, always good and evil. There's the bad guy and the good guy. And, uh, you know, who's going to be victorious. So othering has been happening for a long time. <laughs> you know, th that, that consciousness of other, that consciousness of, you know, the hierarchy, me versus them, however it shows up. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been around for millennia. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, prior to us jumping on, we were having a conversation about everything that's happening in the, the world. I mean, here in Redlands, you know, there's, there's a variety of fires. I know the air quality might not be the best down there. Here it is. It's not looking the best. But um, it almost feels as if, like, the earth is kind of shaking to awake us, um, to align with the principle of oneness and recognizing the ways in which we have been dividing or separating ourselves from others and the destruction that that has caused. Whether it's dividing or, or creating a separateness from a human to human level, or even creating a separateness from humans to the earth that we're upon, instead of the interconnectedness, the interdependence that we all share with each other. And it would seem then if we align with the concept of oneness, true wholeness, that, that opens the door to so many of the solutions for the issues and seemingly difficulties that we're experiencing as a, as a race. Amen. One baby one, I think it's also indicative of how, uh, because some of these fires, probably a lot of them weren't started by natural causes, started by people. Yes. And how a few can affect the many. Yes. And we see that that's what we're exploring here as well. You know, the power systems and things like that you know, even referred to the 99 percenters and the one percenters, how a few can affect the many that are, you know, that are asleep, just asleep. You know, if we want to take it, there's other words that come to my mind, but as a man of the cloth, I'll keep them to myself. <laughs> <laughs> right. But folks that are just asleep and then do these destructive things without care or concern for others, yeah. which it comes back to your point, our connectedness, our oneness, and, and the call to wake up to that and what we can do, anything, anything and everything that we can do to wake us up to that. Right, right. Yep. Definitely. All right, well, moving, moving along, I just wanted to get your ideas. He talks about the election on page 124, Elijah Muhammad on page 125 and uh, through 127. And then he also highlights Malcolm X because Malcolm X was uh, one of the, oh, I left the L out of Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm X was one of the main followers of Elijah Muhammad until he went to Mecca. And on the top of page 128, uh, Ma uh, Malcolm X, who then changed his name, he said, never have I witnessed such an overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood as is practiced by people of all colors and races, races uh, here in this ancient holy land. I totally reject Elijah Muhammad's racist philosophy, which is labeled Islam, only to fool and misuse gullible people as he fooled and misused me. But I only blame myself and no one else for this fool that I was and the harm that my evangelical, evangelical or evangelic foolishness in behalf has done to others. And that really brings it back to the idea that uh, racist ideas love believers, not yes. thinkers. Yes. And therefore, when an individual is willing to begin to think critically, upon particular beliefs that may have been put in place by way of other individuals, and you begin to look at that from a objective standpoint, or you separate yourself from the belief itself and can think upon that, suddenly you start getting intuitive hits or guidance that can redirect you towards something totally different. Yes. And the, the charismatic, those charismatic individuals prey on the believers as well. Yeah. You know, that, 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 it's, that without thinking critically, you're just like, oh, I need something to believe in because it makes me feel alive. Right. Whether it's life giving or life taking. Right. right? I, I, I love that. 
you know, back to the election thing real quick, if I, if I could just rewind for a second. Yes. Um, how many of us learned, I, I rem, well, I remember back then around that time during that, during that process, there was such a distrust. You know, it was, for me, it wasn't, an, it wasn't an anti-white. I understand for him, it was anti-white. It was, didn't, I don't remember having an experience about color. I remember having an experience about power hmm. and manipulation and what people can do. And a feeling of powerlessness in the face of that. And I think some of the corruption that more and more and more is being highlighted and how things operate within the United States of America as well, the corruption of power and that that that, that can bring about. And I, I remember feeling, I think when I read this, the feeling that he had toward whites is a feeling that I had toward the system or the establishment or in you know, injustice, that, 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 that it's just... This isn't how it's supposed to be. Whether Bush won or Gore won, somehow it's a vote and it has to be fair. That's the process, right? <laughs> Life isn't fair, but still, there's a, if there's a process set up, it's supposed to be you vote and your vote's counted. And, that, and, we're, and we're coming into that cycle again right now with the whole mail-in ballot idea and, 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 and you know ID cards and all that kind of stuff. I don't know that we want to go down that rabbit hole right now, but just the general idea of distrust as well is something that I know that I continually have to wrestle with. Like, are we really even living in a, 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 a I don't even want to say a fair system because the system is just not fair, but in, in, a, in, a, in a real reality, in, in what's a real reality? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, anyway, that kind of gets me going a little bit. Uh, the reality is what we all make it to be, but just the, 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 the opportunity for, again, for just a few to affect the many based on racist ideas, uh, ideas of power, economy, all these types of things. But I just, I continue to wrestle with and dance with daily. Yeah. Even as a privileged white, you know, <laughs> the most privileged person of, of any room that I'll walk into most of the time, the awareness of that, of that fact. And I don't know what I'm saying anymore, but um, yeah, just, just, Dr. King says the arc, you know, things swing toward justice. I just, you know, let's start swinging a little harder and faster. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's interesting you say that because in this chapter, he does touch upon the idea that, you know, racist policies, which create inequity, often do not just impact a one specific race or ethnic group, but it impacts a mass amount of individuals of all shades, all colors. Yep. And, and therefore identifying those racist policies to create equity is something yeah. that is imperative for the collective consciousness of America here in America for us to do. Yes. I mean, and the world, but and the world. And then spring springboarding back to, to Malcolm X as well. Um, what that, that what he in, in believing, in Elijah Muhammad, how many lives he affected in a way that he came to see, oh, I don't, I don't buy into that anymore. And I guess to the testimony of what you were speaking to earlier though, the, just the power of his change, that he actually changed by being exposed to new ideas. And as he said, overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood. Right. Changed and transformed him. Then he used the power of his voice to come back and inspire others on behalf of what's right and just. I love that. Th that whole story is a wonderful story as well. It's, it's, re it's very powerful. Yeah. It's uh, definitely that uh, hero's journey arc, you know? Yeah, the hero's journey arc, mythology. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see here. There's a, a few points. And if, I, if we get to your paragraph, Rev. Charles, please let me know. Um, he said, whenever, whenever someone classifies people as European descent as biologically, culturally, or behavioral inferior, whenever someone says there is something wrong with white people as a group, someone is articulating a racist idea. That is in the middle of page 128. And then there is a large paragraph that follows uh, that I would encourage everybody to read, but I'm not going to read because it's, uh, it's quite long. But he does go into then what does anti-racist mean? Uh, Anti-racist is to never mistake the global march of white racism for the global march of white people. 
Mm. To be anti-racist is to never make an anti-racist hate of white racism for the racist hate of white people. To be anti-racist is to never conflate racist people with white people, knowing there are anti-racist whites and non-racist. Uh, non uh, and racist and ra non racist non-whites. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Which I think is a very important point. It's not just grouping an entire group of people. And at times in conversations that I have with, with family who, who are white or Caucasian, at times that is a, one of the main pushbacks that they have, you know, and I, I feel that that is an important point to recognize and to reflect upon and to see the ways in which either you carry that or don't carry that. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the top of page 129, to be anti-racist is to see ordinary white people as frequent victimizers of people of color and frequent victims of racist power. It's not one or the other. And that was a, a, a particular sentence then that I had to sit with a little bit longer to really articulate what he was trying to, to refer to. And again, this is conversation starter. This is not firm beliefs of Rev. Charles or myself. These are yep. things that we have been pondering and we're reading this book to have these type of discussions. So absolutely, yes. that we wanna hear from, yeah. What was the one that you, uh, Jafon said you needed to sit with a little bit, that last one? Yeah, yeah, to be anti-racist is to see ordinary white people as the frequent victimizers of people of color and the frequent victims of racist power. And to not group them into one or the other or to say the totality of individuals is on one side or the totality of people are on the other side. Right. But recognize as with all other races of people, you can fall on either side of the coin. And it's individual, not behavioral based upon a, an entire group. And to be able to really see the individual for the individual while all simultaneously uh, recognizing as we started this conversation, seeing the divinity within the people who fall on either side of the equation. Yes. Yes. And therein lies a significant rub right there. That's yes. discipline. To bring it back to principle, how can I, with whoever or whomever, whatever group or individuals in front of me, bear witness to the divine? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. To be anti racist. Yeah, I think that it, you know, it's, it's very easy, as is, you know, Center for Spiritual Living philosophy, New Thought philosophy. It's very easy to sit back on it in a chair and uh, what do they call it? Like a Monday morning quarterback or whatever. Monday, that's right. Monday morning quarterback. And, and to, I to done, yeah, yeah. Yeah. just sitting and, in judgment of, right? To sitting in judgment or sitting in, in speaking as if you have it all figured out because you understand a few basic principles. And it is an entirely different thing to be able to embody the principles into an actual way of living. Yes. And, and that comes with knowing, as it is with the racist, racism, race conversations. It is very easy for anybody to sit on wherever they fall on this very large spectrum and say, this is how it is, and this is why out there is not the way it's supposed to be. Yep. It is an entirely different thing for us from an individual level to go within and begin to do the inner work necessary to embody that so it is a way of living. And we expand past, not stay in the small little cocoon of comfort, but we expand past our perceived or preconceived idea of how things are into the potential, which is infinite, of how things are meant to be. Yes. Yes. That's, I don't have anything to say except well, yes. <laughs> well, that, that's something that I've really been been sitting with a lot, Rev. Charles, is, man, you know, I did a, a thing today where I work with a addiction group um, in North Dakota, and I, I just do uh, a mindfulness type session with them. And um, to really make sure that I'm not trying to appear as if I, or, or internally think that I am in the superior state and bestowing some sacred knowledge on them. Instead, how can I begin to recognize the humanity and the inherent yes. work that we all share and learn from them as they may be able to learn from me, mm -hmm. but finding this uh, balance where I'm, I'm, I'm living instead of just 
intellectually understanding, you know, we've, and, and then I'll get back to this, but we've, and I speak to about myself, have been accumulating these intellectual bricks of knowledge for quite some time. I pick up books, um, I, I watch videos, I listen to sermons, I have notebooks full of notes. I've been accumulating these intellectual bricks of knowledge that are powerful, but they're just simply that, intellectual ideas. If I am able to pull them out of my tough shed, <laughs> of my mind, where these bricks are overflowing, and begin to grab them and internally begin to put them into play by way of constructing something as to how I choose to show up, that is where the magic happens. It is yes. not just reading and quoting scriptures or quoting Ernest Holmes or quoting philosophies or quoting ideas. It is living, living the ideas and living the philosophy and becoming an example of that without having to say anything. And yeah. that's, that's where I'm, I'm kind of have been moving towards in my experience. Love it. It's in the living, right? It's in the doing. And that is a reflection of the consciousness. That's a reflection of the bricks, right? Right. What you're constructing in the living, in the doing. Um, a word that came to me when you were <clears throat> sharing that just now is for 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 myself is humility. And 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 I think if we're a true student of life, humility must come along with it because we realize life can bring you to your knees, and will. And so then, what bricks do I have to pull on at that point in time right. to just start to stand back up even? You know, whatever the thing might be, a health challenge, a loss of a loved one, uh, financial challenge, these types of things. Uh, but it is in the living and in the doing, and, and the proof is in the pudding. How do I show up when the, when the, when the, when the chips are down? Right. Uh, and that's what he's inviting us to as well, continually, you know, like when the chips are down and, and you're once again in another opportunity where you could either operate from the old program or call yourself up into an anti-racist idea and operate from there. Right. Yep. Amen. Yeah, definitely. All right. So I'll touch upon right on your phone. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know how it goes. You never know what will come up in these conversations. Love it. So on page, let's see, 130, I think I am. Um, actually, 129. This is a con uh, concept that we've been talking about, but we must discern the difference between racist power policymakers and white people. It is not mm. all one. Uh, racist power, which is hoarding of wealth and resources, has the most to do with, uh, ha has the most to lose in building an equitable society. So equity, evening the playing field, will require not, there cannot be mass hoarding of wealth and resources. It is a distribution. And, and obviously we can get into that at a later time. And then racist power produces racist policies out of self-interest and then produces racist ideas to justify those policies, <laughs> which is a, a powerful concept. And then kind of leading on from there, but these racist ideas also suppress the resistance to policies that are detrimental to white people as well. Yep. So it is not just to this one group of people, though we can see that it is spread across the the spectrum or distribution. Any thoughts about that, Rev. Charles? And I see we had a, a comment come in too. Do we have a comment? What's, what's that? Uh, Carrie says, like Malcolm X, we have to always be searching and questioning, be willing to question our own truth. We have to stop letting Facebook think for us and become our belief. Always ask one more question. Hmm. Keep digging. You know, with a... Uh, with the Science of Mind magazine, I recently uh, submitted an article for uh, their December issue that's focused on divine truth. And to Carrie's point, that is one thing that I, I really tried to showcase or highlight is this idea, you know, it's like, how do we even know what truth is? And in the search for truth, we often recognize that throughout our lives, there have been a variety of truths or things that we've believed to be true, often passed down from people before us, our parents, people around us, our community. So in the search for divine truth, we begin to question or at least do some introspective type process around those things that we've embraced to be true. 
And in that, so many of the layers begin to fall away. And what remains from my perspective is this foundation, this bedrock of divine truth, which are the principles that we discussed that there's one power, it's whole, perfect and complete, flowing through all things, we're one with it, it's breathing through us, it's moving, it's that which exists, it's the space in which we create in. And that is then what seems to be the bedrock or the foundation. But in searching for, for what we deem to be true, uh, that critical thinking is. Have you have you <clears throat> have you found many of those beliefs that you've that you've kind of unearthed that were there that were handed to you that you've let go of? Do you have a do you have a, an example or two of of, of those oh, that you've yeah. per, of the personal work that you've done that you're willing to oh, share? Yeah, I mean, one belief is that uh, that I unconsciously be or. I don't know whether I was conscious or not, but embraced was the idea that I wasn't as valuable and worthy as the people around me. That mm. was one thing that I don't think my, nobody told me that, but I gathered all the things and brought that within. Another one is uh, the belief that money is, is very difficult to attract and there's never enough. Mm. That was something that I saw always growing up um, that having the things, you know, just a variety. It, it's more so centered around the concept of, of what your worth is, mm. whether internally or also monetarily in the world of, of material. Um, and those are things that I, I really had to begin to identify in addition to, you know, what the church that I grew up in and that never really rung true for me, but uh, beginning to dive deeper into the Bible and recognizing that perhaps the stories that are being shared aren't actual historic descriptions, but are stories used to pull a greater me message or meaning from the stories that are told. Mm. Yep. I read a post, uh, speaking of not letting Facebook think for us, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> I read a post earlier this morning, somebody uh, said, you just mentioned the Bible, that there were no white people in the Bible. All right. So just spend some time and think about that. There were no white people in the Bible. Just think about where it was written, who was writing it and all that. And not even the pages it was written on were white. <laughs> I, saw, I saw that. Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. I think I, maybe David Alexander shared it. David, Yeah. David said he, he was hyping on somebody else's comment. I thought that was just, just as far as the, you know, the power structures and where they come from, the ideas that are handed down. I mean, that's an idea. That's, it's an example of an idea that's handed down mostly within white communities, but all over the place. Jesus was white, the disciples were white, all that kind of, you know, and, and then that starts to form our idea about life and power as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that search for truth or questioning what you believe to be true for many is extremely uncomfortable. It's, it brings a sense of fear, it brings a sense of vulnerability, because when, for, at least for myself, when I began questioning, that which I believe to be true, I'm then stepping foot into the unknown. And then in that unknown, it allows me to question, well, have I been building my life upon a foundation that isn't true in nature? Yeah. And being willing to admit, as Malcolm X did, okay, I bought into this, I drank that Kool-Aid, but I'm not going to drink it anymore. Not even to admit that you were wrong, but to admit that you don't believe the way that you do anymore. Right. And to be willing to stand up with that in the face of your community, in the face of, uh, you know, Bishop Carlton Pearson is another extraordinary example of that. He lost everything when he said in front of you, know, however big his community was, 30, 40, 50,000 people. You know what? I can't I can't go along with this anymore. I can't go along with there's no that there's a devil, that there's Satan. I can't go along with it, you know, that we're outside of God anymore. I just can't it's, I can't do it. And he had to stand in front of that community and watch it week after week after week dwindle away all of it went away yeah what a powerful and story powerful story and then what happened i know i'm doing a lot of pointing and i do yeah. a lot of this so it's i okay. i'm it's okay <laughs> well just for those out there um talking with the hands but then the rush of new friends and new individuals that came to him to lift him up the beckwiths you know david alexander all, all so many folks you know, I, I, he, he spoke at my center once and, and, and I did some, you know, just and this rush of folks that came to him. I, I guess what I want to say is when, when we're willing to stand up and, 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 and question and critically think and think like you've talked about and think, 
and have a structure become dismantled? No, we have to know because one of the things that could keep us from dismantling a structure is fear of what's next or fear of the unknown or I'm going to be abandoned or I'm just going to be left out here all alone. We have to know that something more life-giving is going to rush in. Yeah. Because that's how it always happens. We have to know something more life-giving is going to rush in. You know, if, if, if you find yourself in circles where racist ideas are talked about all the time and you choose, you, you find the courage at one point to stand up and say, you guys, this, this isn't right anymore. It's, it's just it's not what it was ever right. It's, this isn't right. Um, I can't go along with this any longer, you know. Um, this is what I know to be so. There's going to be fallout from that, but no, a greater community is going to rush in. I think that's an important thing to remember too, as we talk about dismantling, unearthing down to that bedrock. Yeah. That all the re resources uh, that we require to build a new life will rush in. Yeah. Yeah. It's a. It's a. I mean, even for myself, having conversations with uh, family members, people close to me who say things that are blatantly racist or discriminatory. Um, it's a, I mean, it's not always well received, but my intentions are, are pure. Yep. People will see your heart. Yeah. 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 And you, my friend, have a good one. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You got it, brother. All right. We got 19 minutes, man. 19 minutes. Um, 19. I only have, let's see. I only have one more slide. So oh, okay, you, cool. you want to We're touch good. upon your, uh, well, I do. It's this, it's this whole idea of the, 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 the power structures that are set up. Like what I'm going to read about white supremacy, the, that paragraph about that. Okay. But the power structures that are actually set up to what seem to support or empower that particular group actually work against that group. And so I just want to read this, uh, on page 132, uh, so bear with me, it's a, par par a long paragraph. White supremacists are the ones supporting policies that benefit racist power against the interest of the majority of white people. White supremacists claim to be pro-white but refuse to acknowledge that climate change is having a disastrous impact on the earth white people inhabit. They oppose affirmative action programs despite women being their primary beneficiaries, white women being their primary beneficiaries. White supremacists rage against Obamacare, even as 43% of the white people who gained life-saving health insurance from 2010 to 2015 were white. They hail Adolf Hitler's Nazis, even though it was the Nazis who launched a world war that destroyed the lives of more than 40 million white people and ruined Europe. They wave Confederate flags and defend Confederate monuments, even though the Confederacy started a civil war that ended with more than 500,000 white American lives lost, more than every other American war combined. White supremacists love that America used to be, even though America, uh, love what America used to be, even though America used to be and still is, teeming with millions of struggling white people. White supremacists blame non-white non -white people for the struggles of white people, when any objective analysis of, of their plight primarily implicates the rich white Trumps they support. As it's, it's, that's not critically thinking. Believers, just on the idea of whatever the tenets are, you know, and whatever the group is. I mean, he, I just thought that was interesting, but you could plug in white supremacists for any radical right. idea. Yeah, so true. So true. And so, that, so, so, so if, if, if white supremacist is hitting, you know, whatever, too close to home or, you, you know, you're just, just plug it, 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 it's, 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 it's just a form. I think he was presenting a formula that without critically thinking, just because I'm, I want to, I want to hang on to some ideology just because is it actually working the way that I want it to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. critical thinking again. Yeah. That's, that's such a, a powerful uh, paragraph there. And then at the bottom of it on, he, he says white supremacist is code for anti-white and anti-white yeah. and, and white supremacy is nothing short of an ongoing program of genocide against the white race. In fact, it's more than that. White supremacist is code for anti-human, a nuclear ideology that possesses ex an existential, existential threat to the human existence. And I kind of put that there at the bottom. It, it's, yep. it's, 
and the anti-white racism which often is prompted when we talk about equality affirmative action leveling the playing field as he says is in in response to those type of things is are as old as civil rights if we remember the emancipation proclamation was in the 1860s mm -hmm. and civil rights recent civil rights was in the the 1960s and a lot of the counter attack for that equity and equality was that it's stripping away the rights of a lot of white folks and as he said going after white people instead of racist power prolongs the policies harming black life in the end anti-right racist ideas in taking some or all the focus off racist power becomes anti-black and as we can see i mean i think it's really circling back to this idea of the power and the importance of of equality and the principle of oneness and beginning to identify the ways in which we participate whether consciously or unconsciously in maintaining or perpetuating the idea of separateness of otherness yes. and as carrie said i mean the ability to not just read one post or stick to one news source or one facebook page or one group of individuals as the end all be all of truth but instead be willing to engage with people who think differently not yes. with the hope of converting them or saving them but in the hope of possibly learning and then also recognizing maybe that spiritual practice of how you can see others as as the divine beings for which they are mm. even if they have totally opposite hurtful shameful or upsetting ideas mm. it makes me <laughs> There's an old, for anybody that watched the Dave Chappelle show, there was a, 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 a <laughs> there was a skit he did when he was a black man who was one of the local leaders of the, of the KKK. Yep, I think Clayton Bigsby. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know he was black and no one else knew he was black because he always wear a hood when he was out in public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a... <laughs> And he was perpetuating all these racist ideas. He's this black guy. He didn't know he was black. He went out to do public public speaking. I always had his hood on. And he's like, yeah, you know, everything anti-black. And then he finally says, you know what? I'm going to take my hood off. I want you all to see who I really am so that you know that I'm serious. And he takes his hood <laughs> off and everybody sees that he's black and everybody just loses their mind. <laughs> I don't know what that made me think right now of just, uh, you know what it makes me think of just the ways that we can be just brainwashed, you know, just, <coughs> we kind of have a theme, <coughs> excuse me, a theme going here today about thinking, but uh, <laughs> of just how we can have no sense of self-reflection and see how we're just, we're, we're a detriment to ourselves if we don't wake up to what's really happening and who we are, who we really are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave Chappelle yeah that that is that was a classic episode yeah it really was um in and in the end of this whole thing he's kind of uh touching oh, upon a variety of things of uh perhaps the ideas that i've been thinking about white people are not accurate and i started reading the next chapter just because i wanted to I've often answered, and we'll get into this maybe next week, but I've often answered, and I think I even did it with Dr. Joe when we were having a conversation of racism, and I've heard many people say cannot be inflicted by black people to white people in America. And I think I may have, have even uttered some type of idea. And the reason why I said that is because uh, I thought well, black people don't have the power or the ability to create policies that then can systematically oppress uh, a particular group of people. And upon further inspection in my own world, and then also uh, through reading, I've realized that that concept in itself is actually dismissing the power that any individual possesses. Mm. Um, so that is not accurate there is we as humans can be racist and discriminatory to all types of people um and we cannot discount the power that one individual can have 
in starting to reshape or shift the world into one, as we often say, that works for everybody. And to do so is to completely strip away the perceived power that I may see within a certain group of people or person itself. So that's something mm -hmm. that I've been, uh, been wrestling with. And that's a few pages in on the next chapter. I, I had to read it just because. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love it. And I, I appreciate and recognize your reflection and willingness to change your idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's case in point. What we're talking about here is a willingness to grow and change and admit, hey, I've got a new way of thinking about this now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love, after having read this entire chapter and then going back to that first paragraph, when he goes to Clarence, his buddy, and he says, I think, you've, I, think I figured white people out. <laughs> And then he gets to the end, he's like, okay, so what is it? At the end, it says, they're aliens. They're aliens. <laughs> they're aliens. And then Clarence sets him straight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, buddy. Um, anyway, I, I just thought that was, a, <laughs> that was a, a funny way to bring that, that conversation back with Clarence back around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that's what I have for, for this week. I, I feel that this is a, it's a really good book, and it's building on itself. Um, it's bringing a lot of powerful points, but as with most books, um, there's a lot of power once you decide to open it up, you know, yes. read the words, <laughs> but then there's even more power when you take the ideas that are reflect as true for you and begin to implement it in your daily life. Um, but you don't know how many books I have behind me that I've failed to, you know, do that magic opening. Open up. Yeah. Oh, that's what a book's for. Oh, yeah. Oh, and there's words. And I can, okay. Oh, and I can actually read them. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Right on. Be willing to be challenged. Definitely. Well, I love it. That's why I love it from um, each author can be a coach. And that's why I love coming from organized sports activities. I loved being coached in, in, in grade school and through high school. I loved it. Make this adjustment here. Reflect on that there. Do you see how this can be better and different? Do you see how doing that works better for the team, et cetera, et cetera? Right. That's what all these, that's what all these points become for me. It's just points to see, to affirm I'm doing the right thing or where I need to pivot, make an adjustment and, and start practicing a new idea or a new, a, a new way of doing things. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Right on. Right on, brother. I don't have anything else for today. Um, no. This is a revolutionary. This is revolutionary. I mean, we finished what a few minutes early. Revolutionary. We'll see how many announcements I can come up come up with. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Jafon, first and foremost. Thank you for being here every Tuesday. Yeah. Tomorrow we've got the Sensational Six with our six new reverends. Thursday I am with uh, practitioner emeritus Linda Watson. She's been a practitioner for a long time and worked worked with spiritual communities all over the country, probably all over the world, thousands of individuals, hundreds of communities. She's a wise woman. She's been around the block, and I know that she'll have some extraordinary insight to share with all of us. That's Thursday. Friday, Life on Love with me. I think the last couple Fridays have been a little different. I've just done a little teaching and sharing. They're fun. Tell a friend. Come. Come hang out on Friday with Life on Love with, with me. Next week, Life on Love is going to be uh, well, it's a lot of fun as well as, as we're going to play a little game called Where in the World is Dr. Joe Hooper? We're going to try and track that guy. We all know he's on sabbatical. He's been on sabbatical for about three months now. He'll be, he'll be back next month, October 15th. Uh, and his first Sunday back will be October 18th, if you want to mark your calendars for that. But you're going to start see seeing his face more the second half of October, just so you know, he's on, still on sabbatical. He hasn't left. He's just still taking some deep breaths and, uh, and doing that whole thing. Um, so yeah, we're going to play a little game called where in the world is Dr. Joe Hooper. <laughs> Hopefully we find him, uh, who knows where we'll find him, but let's, we're going to have some fun with it and uh, tracking him down and then see, uh, see what kind of good dialogue and conversation we can have. So that's next week. Also tune in for that. We're having fun. Um, Rocking and rolling. Jafon, I appreciate you, my friend. Keep uh, keep being a change agent, brother. Change agent, brother. You're doing Thank you. it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, and everybody. As all, yeah, thank that, Yeah, I was going to say before I cut you off, go ahead. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for continuing to financially support the center as well. Um, there's a give button, a place to donate here on your screen. 
Um, and we really appreciate you sharing your financial good with us to support the center, the staff, um, our building, that we want it to, you know, the, 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 just keep the building alive while we're, while, while we're away so that when we come back together, it's more brilliant and beautiful and bold and this tower of light here in our local community and beyond. Um, it takes all of our financial resources and good collectively as a community to do that. So thank you for continuing to share boldly. We appreciate that. Um, we you say something, Jafon? No, oh, I was just going to thank everybody, as always, for their willingness to, to tune in and their willingness to continue through this conversation with us. I, I really, really appreciate that. Yes, me too. Amen. All right, everybody, have a beautiful Tuesday. I pray that you make it the best day ever. Much peace, much love.